It's Monday. It's January 16th. And the word of the day is once again, back fife and gesicht, which still means a slappable face or a face that's really in need of a punch. Used in a sentence, even Republicans are aware that Matt Gates has the platonic back fife and gesicht, and he almost got the slap he desperately needed. I learned a lot about edging that day. Okay, Heath, if you're going to use back hapas of beef every time there's a punchable Republican, that's the only word you'll ever use. You got to mix this up, man. You got to mix it up. Yeah. Wait, are you introducing like a no repeating yourself rule? Because, you know, if we've got that, I'm going to have to rip up my entire story about the Tories fucking up my country. I'm going to start right from scratch. <laughs> uh, I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delay from America and an island that's not Europe, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Kevin McCarthy speaks for a house divided. We finally find the line for bullshit not even the Tories will support. And now that we got the private sector involved, space travel is finally failing efficiently. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow Skeptocrats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, I'm thinking we start with a little... Uh, what I like to call a heart moment. So, anything you want to say from your heart before we talk about the news of 2023? Ooh. Yeah, I'm I'm confused. Are you trying to get me to be emotionally open? Yeah. You do know I'm British, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, Marsha's wedding mm. vows were all right then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did. <laughs> well, no, that was Nicholas. I did. <laughs> Fair enough. Fine. We'll get to heart stuff later off the air. In our lead story tonight. Matt Gates almost got punched in the face on the so floor close. of the U.S. <laughs> so <laughs> close. Oh, I think about it all the time now. I have dreams with Matt Gates almost getting punched in the face, and then I wake up and I'm shaking like like I'm Roger Rabbit and I heard shave and a haircut. <laughs> and this is just another example of how Republicans ruin everything. They can't even punch a sex trafficker correctly and finish the bit. Allegedly. And ever since that moment, <laughs> they just kept on failing. Later that day, after failing 14 times in a row, everybody already knows about this, but Marsh, we're going to catch you up on our legislative bodies. Right after 14 times in a row of losing the ballot, Kevin McCarthy finally won the ballot to become Speaker of the House. And he was getting blocked that whole time because 20 House Republicans wouldn't vote for him because he wasn't quite evil enough. He is, to be clear, a conservative piece of shit. But they were like, and we want a Nazi pony, or I'm not voting for you without a Nazi pony. And he eventually gave him a Nazi pony. And he promised extra power for a bunch of alt-right lunatics who now own anti-Semitic ponies. So that's fun. That's how we got the current leader of the House of Representatives. I mean, Heath, not to downplay your story, but catering to right-wing bigots has been Republican politics since Nixon. It's a grand old tradition at this point. Yeah, I don't like getting used to it. <laughs> yeah, and like, I know this is a weird side note, but like, we can all agree that horses are fascists, right? 100%. Because, let's look at it. They're, they're overly loved by the extremely wealthy. They're usually found in the police or the military. Some of them are always seen in camouflage gear. You know, that's mostly the zebras. Um, horseshoes, <laughs> those are basically animal knuckle dusters. All these horses, they might as well all be called Rudolf Hoss or Hermann Gelding. You know, I'm talking about Ein Falk, Ein Reich. Ein Falk, 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 Ein Reich. So, There's those so you... much thing and stuff there. <laughs> so for oh. those of you who don't follow along with all of our podcasts, Mark... <laughs> A month and a half ago mentioned that he was afraid of horses. Mm. And some people on our Patreon were like, oh, how can you not like horses? And so Marsh has been waiting for one full month to Fuck be him. like, I have several <laughs> anti-horse arguments as the head of Skeptic Magazine. You think I didn't bring notes? <laughs> <laughs> His shaking hand is slowly putting flashcards down. Let's talk about the news. Fuck horses. horses. <laughs> Had to start with that. The important stuff. The important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about the first week of governing from the new GOP controlled house. But first, I want to quickly mention the amazing job by Democratic Representative Hakeem Jeffries of New York. He's the new House Minority Leader. So he gave a speech right before McCarthy officially took over. And it was delightful to watch, even knowing what was about to happen, that McCarthy was going to be taking power, especially delightful 
because McCarthy, he got all excited and he a little too quickly stood right next to the podium area, clearly expecting to be handed the gavel like, you know, any minute. So he's standing right there and he's swaying back and forth. He's, he's getting impatient. Jeffrey sees this and he decided to have some fun with it. And he did a bunch of, I'm sure, improvised pump fakes where it seemed like he was done, but then he kept going. It was the best. And like McCarthy would start to lean over and what? No, nope, oh, he's like, and I have to walk back. <laughs> this included doing literally the entire alphabet with a positive liberal word for each letter and then a negative conservative word. So the blue team's cheering and clapping after that energetic, rousing moment. And then Jeffries, finally, he's like, all right, I'll do it. He's like, and now a guy from, he's from a place, he has uh, parents, I don't know, Kevin McCarthy, okay, <laughs> there you go. It, it was like that moment when the reptile guy introduces the principal for no reason, right? Everyone's like losing their mind for the baby crocodile, and then he's like, all right, all right, enough of this. Here's a guy to talk to you about fire drill timing, huh? <laughs> and the speech was so great. First of all, I want him to carry on past the end of the English alphabet into like the Cyrillic alphabet just to really fuck with them, just to find any other letters <laughs> that, that they could amazing. think of. But my favorite thing about it was his little pause and his little smile just before he started doing that alphabet bit because he was so happy, so happy about what was to come. It was the way that I looked just before I started doing that bit about horses earlier in the show. I, just, I knew it was coming and I was excited. Marsh looked at three different cameras somehow. The angle kept changing. He's got a smile. So here's what the GOP has been doing with control of the house. Very first thing, this is so ridiculous. Very first thing, they voted... To help out millionaire and billionaire tax evaders, they passed a bill that would massively cut the funding for the IRS, reversing the large investment in the agency as part of the Inflation Reduction Act last year. According to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, the new funding from Biden is expected to generate about $180 billion in revenue over the next 10 years, mostly by catching extremely wealthy tax cheaters. The new Republican bill, on the other hand, would lose about $114 billion in revenue over that same period. But to make it even dumber, and I guess less dumb at the same time, there's no way this GOP bill is actually going to happen and go through. And they knew that. There's no way it passes the Senate, and there's no way the president, whose plan it would directly sabotage, is going to sign it. So just to review, the first order of business for House Republicans was signaling that they support millionaire tax evaders, but doing nothing to actually do a thing. On day one, they did nothing evilly. Yeah, well, you know, look, we spent the last few years doing symbolic stuff like legalizing marijuana, protecting gay marriage. We've all been declaring what's important to us here when we have control of the Congress. Right? Because like, oh, won't someone think of the tax evaders? That's a hell of a bold move for your priority one. But... I guess it's kind of nice to see politicians finally acting in the interest of the people who put them into power. You know, that's representative democracy right there. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we have. We also got a new body formed within the House to investigate anti-conservative bias in law enforcement. Um, they're mostly talking about that time the federal government prosecuted domestic terrorists who tried to overthrow American democracy with an armed insurrection. Those domestic terrorists were conservative so that was anti-conservative bias <laughs> i mean it's also anti-neckbeard bias and it's uh anti-smelling like boiled peanuts bias whatever regardless with a party line vote of 221 to 211 the house created the select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government they created a committee that's going to use th the weapons of the federal government <laughs> to go after the federal government for weaponizing the federal government and that committee chair is going to be Jimothy Jordan of Ohio. Okay, don't worry about it. I got this. I got this. Okay, Deep State, if you're listening, all you need to do is fuck some kids, and I hear you like doing that anyways, and Jim Jordan won't be able to find you. It's his big weakness. <laughs> I, I just really hope that this committee ha ends up having to investigate itself for weaponizing the government, like some kind of Ouroboros of political theater. You've got Jim yeah. Jones sort of running between the witness <laughs> box and the bench like it's the restaurant scene from Mrs. Doubtfire. It'd be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's fun. We got a, the plot from the departed here <laughs> in our government. And another important initiative, Kevin McCarthy announced last week 
that he's going to look into expunging the impeachment of Donald Trump. Now, I said impeachment singular there. Which one? Great question. Uh, I, we, we don't know. Maybe just all of them, McCarthy's thinking. He said he feels bad about all the difficult times that Donald Trump went through. So I guess after they take those pieces of paper from Donald Trump's permanent record and pull them out and scrap them, and then, then they do the, the flashy thing from Men in Black to the entire country, after that, it'll be like the impeachments and the crimes never happened. So, yeah. Cool. Hey, while we're undoing national tragedies caused by bad actors, why don't you undo 9-11, Kevin McCarthy? You just want to put in a little thing? No such thing as 9-11? Yeah, bring back George Santos's mom. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, one more thing they did. We have a new caucus in the House. According to the announcement last week by GOP Representative Jim Banks of Indiana, he's going to be forming the first ever anti-woke caucus fuck you man yeah, fuck you indeed that's exactly what they're calling it and fuck you they'll be in charge of fighting the tyranny of political correctness that is their wording and <laughs> in other news uh the u.s house has more people named mike than it has women holding committee chairs just a fun fact that's not related to that first thing hopefully all those mics can hold back the tyrannical reign of political correctness and keep the balance of the force in the galaxy for white men that'll be fun okay okay you know i think there's just something about all those mics that personally i kind of like that i kind of like having <laughs> these mics in power mics have been underrepresented for far too long you know there's never been a single mike or michael ever been in charge of either of our countries <laughs> when will america be ready for its first mike president <laughs> okay but you would be michael right like if mm. you were like representative in U.S. Congress, you'd be representative Michael Marshall. Yeah, you don't want to be a Mike in power. You yeah, Michael, have some respect for yourself. Come yeah. on, the dignity of the office of the of the anti walk office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, bottom line, it's a good fucking thing that enough people on the good team summoned the energy to vote for Democrats in the Senate. It all counts and it all has consequences. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, like all jokes aside, keep in mind that if we hadn't won the Senate, these things would be laws. <laughs> Holding pattern. Holding oh. pattern. <laughs> then you could be the Mike Caucus. Mike Caucus. <laughs> Mike, Mike, Mike Caucus. Mike. See, okay. that's why I use Michael. That's why I use Michael. <laughs> On that, uh, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. So you can only kick the ball. Unless you're the goalie, yeah. That's why it's called football over there. It's certainly part of it. Hey, guys, you talking sports? What's going on? What's the happy app? Oh, Heath. Dude, what happened to you? Oh, yeah, this. Um, I haven't been to therapy in a while, and sometimes when I don't talk to a therapist, I can feel a little incomplete. I mean, there are literally chunks of your body missing. Yeah, yeah, missing. Uh, like I said, not all there. But Heath, if therapy can help you be the very best version of yourself, why don't you try BetterHelp? Oh, what's BetterHelp? If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, it's flexible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists any time at all for no additional charge. Wow, that sounds great. Where do I sign up? If you want to get closer to your best self, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. All right. Well, uh, what do you say? Lunch? Can you even eat right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I can put food in my body. Okay, I mean, I'll watch that. You should see it. It's pretty cool. And we're back. Uh, next up in headlines, in Strike While the Defiance Hot News, in, <laughs> in my role as the UK correspondent on this show, it's my job to keep you updated on events back home in the motherland. And as such, you're kind of lucky that I'm still doing my job because pretty much everyone else in the country right now isn't because every part of my country is currently on strike right now amidst cost of living, rises, stagnating wages and falling working conditions across the country. Okay, right. But on the plus side, one of your princes released the book equivalent of when your drinking buddy starts sobbing in the middle of bowling. So pros and cons, right? Pros and cons. Uh, he New did book. do that. He did do that. There you go. 
Uh, so all through winter so far, workers all around the country have been engaging in levels of industrial action literally not seen since the famous Winter of Discontent in 1979, which is what eventually brought down the Labour government at the time and heralded the rise to power of Margaret Thatcher. Sorry, I, just to be clear, I'm in Liverpool. You'd learn that if you're going to say her name, you whisper it. So, oh, you know, okay. you avoid reminding anybody nearby that she ever lived. The only exception to that <laughs> is that you're allowed to sing her name at the top of your voice, but only as part of a song that celebrates her being dead. It's uh, it's to the tune oh. of Give It Up by Casey and the Sunshine Band. By Casey <laughs> okay. and the Sunshine Band. It's uh, In the Mud, Maggie's in the Mud. It's very Got popular it. in these parts. Yeah. Very, very popular. <laughs> For our younger American listeners, uh, Miss Thatcher uh, was when England made the worst teacher in your middle school in charge of their country for a little while, and it went exactly how you think it went. <laughs> Yeah, not well. But okay, you know how your worst teacher from middle school did not have a giant Spaceballs helmet made of recessive DNA and Kevlar spray? They fixed that with Margaret Thatcher. They sure did, yeah. They did, they did. They didn't have that weakness to attack. So strikes have been happening all across the UK this entire winter. The industries involved include, but are not even limited to, teachers, university staff, barristers, Train operators, bus drivers, refuse collectors, paramedics, nurses, postal workers, driving instructors, the Environment Agency, the National Highways Agency, and the Border Force. You know, the latter of whom being the UK equivalent of the TSA, all on strike. Yeah, that's right. Pay up or throw out your own water bottles without ever catching a terrorist in the history of our organization. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know you're, this is all bad, but you need to check your socialist privilege over there, Marsh. I'm sure it's all rough in the short term, but if all those workers you described were in the U.S., and in the U.S. they would strike whenever conservative idiots fuck up the entire economy, we'd probably have socialized medicine and a wealth tax on billionaires. I'm, I I just think that could be good. <laughs> do we need a king with a castle? Is that how you do it? Is it the king with the castle? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, things aren't looking likely to improve anytime soon, partly because we have got so many conservative idiots fucking up the country and the economy. The civil service have announced that there's going to be strikes of 100,000 workers in February, which is a decent chunk of the workforce here in the UK. The railway strikes alone in this country have their own Wikipedia page. They're that extensive. And it, it all got so hard to keep track of exactly what was on strike and when that in December, The Guardian started publishing a handy calendar of upcoming strikes that you could refer to. And That's it, awesome. It was sort of a bit <laughs> like an advent calendar, but behind every door, there was a picket line because the team that was meant to put the chocolates there are striking over the threatened redundancies in the new year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. And, and look, support for the workers, of course. But Marsh, mm. I have a question. I have actually ridden British Rail a couple of times. So how can you actually tell when they're on strike? Is there Are there signs? <laughs> I bet it's a, there must be a sign system. There's probably signs, yeah. Like, yeah. notice, we're being extra passive-aggressive today. <laughs> Go ahead and ask us a question. We would love to answer your question, American <laughs> guy, who is huffing and puffing because he tried to walk down a really long platform just now. <laughs> so all of this has sent a really clear message to the government that something needs to be done. And so, in response... Grant Shapps, the business secretary, and man who recently published a photo of him at a business meeting that he'd photoshopped Boris Johnson out of. That's a real That's thing. Look yeah. it up. Love that. Grant Shapps announced a vague new bill to essentially make it legal to sack any staff who participate in strike action. And the worst thing about all this is, the whole way through this, the Tory government is looking around for who's responsible. Like the hot dog costume mean guy. Except it's worse than that, <laughs> because... They've been in power for 12 years now. 12 years now. So it's it's more like a long string of hot dog costume mean guys <laughs> looking for the previous hot dog costume mean guy who was looking for who was responsible. Okay, if you don't know that meme, definitely check it out. That's the perfect description. It's a guy in the hot dog costume. He just crashed a car, and then he's, like, looking around trying to find the person responsible yeah. for the hot dog car. <laughs> it's perfect. And yeah, and now it's a big string and they're all like sprinkling lettuce on the hot dog car. The crash. <laughs> and since David Cameron, okay, successive Tory governments have had well over a decade now to mould this country into what they want it to be. And this is what they've chosen. It's a broken system where there are nurses relying on food banks and where the bins are overflowing while the workers' pockets are emptying. Yeah, so... America. They're aiming for America. <laughs> privilege, Marsh. <Yeah>. British <laughs> privilege. Next up in headlines in Woman or Man Sand Sand Band News. 
We have an odd relationship with bad news here at the Puzzle in a Thunderstorm LLC. On one hand, we, like you, want our fellow humans to thrive, be happy, and enjoy all their freedoms. But when bad stuff happens, our jobs are a lot easier. I'm not saying it's a tough choice or anything. I'm just saying it's a conflict. And we got an example of that this week when newly elected Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders... (laughs) Ooh, ooh. Signed Sorry. An, ooh, ooh. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> signed an executive order banning the use of the term Latinx in official state documents, saying the government should use, quote, ethnically appropriate language, end quote. The citizenry of Arkansas has already agreed on what we call you people. So it's you people, by the way. This is just red tape. That's the executive order we just got. For real. Yeah. I mean, she said she was banning, quote, culturally insensitive language. And like, maybe she's just jaded from all that time she spent as press secretary deleting the N-word from official White House statements. <laughs> yeah. Right. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, Latinx is a genderless form of the word Latina or Latino and was created in acknowledgement that not everybody identifies as one gender or the other, which is a much bigger deal when words in your language have a gender. And and look, I want to be clear. There is a conversation going on within the community in question about how useful that word is or not. And I am not going to weigh in on that as a white guy whose Spanish is limited to what I learned from Dora the Explorer. But regardless of what you think about the word Latinx, banning the word is definitely not the solution. In fact, The only result of this action is to bother trans people. And let's be honest, that's exactly why Sarah Huckabee Sanders' office is interested in it. Right. Yes, absolutely. And by the way, 10,000 Heath points for any restaurant owner in Arkansas who very much legally takes away a cheese plate from Sarah Huckabee Sanders and makes her leave. Send us a video of that. We'll make it into a musical. I'll watch it every day. Yeah. (laughs) Please get those points. Uh, But don't take my word for it. Vanessa Cardenas, uh, executive director of the progressive national organization America's Voice, called the order, quote, an effort by Republicans to divide and distract from the issues that are top of mind for American voters, including the Latino community. Adding, quote, the Latino community in Arkansas and across the country care about improving their economy, access to health care and better education for their children. And that is what Governor Huckabee should be focused on, end quote. Okay, now I think that's a cynical take. I honestly believe that Huckabee Sanders just wants to offer good old-fashioned Republican respect to this community of, checks notes, criminals, drug smugglers, rapists, and (laughs) I assume some good people. (laughs) Yeah. Now, either way, it's obvious that this term bothers Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So, for that reason, and that reason alone, I will be using it exclusively from now on. But, (laughs) but... So that I don't wade into political issues I don't understand or have a voice in, I'll be using it for every ethnic group as well. Which is why I'm happy to turn our next headline over to our very special Inglex friend, Michael Marshall. Thank you, Elia. (laughs) Finally, finally the respect. (laughs) And speaking of how much you want to die, let's toss things over to our next sponsor this week, Policy Genius. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick, here to remind you that the medical establishment is literally collapsing as we speak. That's right, Eli. Exacerbated by COVID and an ever more profit-motivated system, healthcare becomes more and more each day a giant mulcher that we, as a society, feed ourselves into. And sure, you can hope you don't get caught in the meat grinder of capitalism. Lord knows that's what we're doing. But it's much better to have life insurance so you don't drag your family in with you. That's right, Marsh. While past generations will look on our current health care with the horror with which we examine child labor, you live right now. And there's actually very little you can do to change that. But you can get insurance from Policy Genius. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in just a few clicks to find you the lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at $17 a month for $500,000 of coverage. And Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. 
Plus, they're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees, and your personal info stays private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net, and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to PolicyGenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's PolicyGenius.com. Policy Genius. I had chest pain for five straight days this week and nobody helped me. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in Briscape Velocity News, the United Kingdom almost put some satellites into orbit last week when they almost successfully launched a rocket and therefore almost became a grown-up country with its own space program that can launch stuff on its own. Okay. okay. So, so yeah, okay. I know I know it is exactly rocket science, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but as far as I know, the blueprint for doing this kind of thing is pretty simple. You hire Nazi rocket scientists after the war, and they build you a space program, and then you defund that whole thing because space is dumb, and then you hire a private company based in California owned by a completely incompetent billionaire to do it for you, right? Isn't that how you're supposed to be? I mean, it appears the UK did everything right in that list, except they didn't find a billionaire who's quite as talented and successful as Elon Musk. Instead, they got Richard Branson of the Virgin Group and their Virgin Orbit branch to help with the launch. So, uh, Marsh, how's the news going over in the UK? It's fine. It's fine. We didn't even want to go to space anyway. Full of foreigners. It's all full of foreigners. You can't get a decent cup of tea there. They don't understand the language. No, didn't want to be out there. Anyway, this this is very clearly the problem, right? There's just, there's fewer Nazis going into the rocket business these days. They're all too busy posting on 4chan and running for local office. Where are the positive role models encouraging young Nazis into engineering? That's what I want to know. <laughs> no Nazis in the STEM fields. It's not fair. Yeah. All right, so before we get to the details of the launch, a little background on Richard Branson for anyone who's not familiar. He's basically the British version of Elon Musk, but I do mean that in a good way, to be clear. He's Elon Musk, but way less evil and also, like, oddly charming, but you don't know why. I mean, yes, Branson is an obnoxious billionaire and egregious tax evader, as far as I understand it, but he seems to be halfway decent when it comes to politics, at least for an obnoxious billionaire. That being said, I'm not sure <laughs> Richard Branson should have any involvement in giant rocket launchers. This is the guy who started Virgin Megastores and Virgin Cola and an alcohol-based soft drink called Virgin Ooze Yikes. and a business called Virgin Brides. Those are all gone now, along with literally hundreds and hundreds of other companies that he's started that have now failed. He just, like, has a random idea, maybe, like, one or two words. He writes out on a post-it, and he puts virgin at the front, and he starts a business. He's like if Andy Wilson was a billionaire. <laughs> hey, hey, virgin is in the title of a lot of Andy's businesses for a reason, Heath, okay? <laughs> okay. Thing is, it should absolutely be a rule that if you try and fail to run trains, you don't get to do space <laughs> stuff. Because trains have got That's a whole fair. load of track telling them where they need to go next. If you, if you can't manage forward and back without fucking it up, you don't get to add ups and downs into no. the equation. No, you had a lot of trouble on the one-dimensional yeah. really thing. We're not giving you two or three. Yeah. So the big launch happened on Tuesday of last week when a Boeing 747 took off from a spaceport in Cornwall, England, carrying a 70-foot rocket, which had nine satellites inside. The plane went up to 35,000 feet, and the rocket detached from the aircraft and did its first stage ignition as planned. From there, the plan was to have the rocket fly about 300 more miles above the Earth and deploy the satellites. But around mile um, zero of that remaining 300, <laughs> Cornwall gets alerted that we have a problem. The rocket's traveling about 11,000 miles an hour at this point. And it fires the second stage ignition, and some kind of explodey fire thing happened, but uh, not the good kind that makes makes it work, the bad kind. That's when the person running the Twitter account for Virgin Orbit tweeted the most British possible description of the clusterfuck in space going 11,000 miles an hour. <laughs> he wrote, we appear to have an anomaly. He also added, 
as we find out more, we're removing our previous tweet about reaching orbit, which they had not. <laughs> We're also putting the champagne back in the fridge. Um, yeah, right. And that champagne would have been from virgin wine, so it probably didn't have much of a shelf life. It <laughs> yeah, would no, I be still good by the next launch. <laughs> yeah. And that's his, like, one of his successful virgin brands. I think it still exists, maybe. It does. Yeah. So, unfortunately for the UK space program, they did not become the ninth country in the world to successfully launch spacecraft into orbit from within their borders. And... My first thought when I'm reading that was, okay, so like it, it all fell back down then. But then I was like, okay, just relax. You're a podcaster. You don't know about all the details of space travel. They probably have some high tech plan for that. But the article I was reading actually didn't address this at all. So I checked another source. I found a BBC article where they actually had the same question that I did about that. They asked Matt Archer, the launch program director for the UK Space Agency, and apparently he could not confirm whether the rocket had fallen back to Earth. He pointed out that if it did, it would fall over unpopulated areas. But still, I feel like he should know if it came back down or not, right? <laughs> no, it, what happened is it landed on Liverpool and they're just hoping nobody noticed. Again, Eli, this is the man who brought us Virgin trains. There is absolutely no chance this rocket would have made it successfully to Liverpool. The satellites would have had to like <laughs> take a replacement bus from Birmingham. <laughs> Also, I feel like the unpopulated area thing, yeah, very. it's just a really good bet, but it's not a guarantee. Even over the ocean, there might be the occasional anomaly boat, right? So I checked on this too. According to a study published last year in Nature Astronomy, we haven't killed anyone with artificial space debris yet, but we have injured people and the odds of killing people is growing because we keep launching more stuff up there and now we're letting people like Elon Musk and Richard Branson do it. So the study looked at the chances of falling space debris, like spent rocket stages, killing one or more people in the next 10 years. And they gave it a 10% shot. But the thing is, if it does land on a boat, there's still like a 10% chance that it's either a billionaire super yacht, a cruise full of anti-vaxxers, or a libertarian sea state. So I'm, I'm fairly all right with those odds. Yeah, you know what? I'm totally yeah. fine. Yeah. I'm totally okay. fine. Also, plus, that's like straight to the VIP section when you get to heaven, right? It's like, oh, oh what's that? Uh, how did I die? Yeah, I got hit by a rocket ship, baby. Open the gates, PD. I'm going <laughs> yeah. in. We should be able to get Christianity on board with NASA a lot better, given that argument. I like that. And uh, just for the record, that 10% number, it doesn't count the odds of a rocket with, like, Tesla's autopilot system and just running straight into a city instead of flying up. <laughs> obviously, okay, to be clear, I, I pointed all that out, but obviously space travel is worth it. But just a reminder, we literally almost killed Big Bird on the Challenger. We did almost kill Big I did Bird. not realize that was true. That really happened. NASA was in talks with Sesame Street to have Big Bird and his teddy bear radar on the Challenger. But it fell through just barely, just in time. Space travel is great. Again, it's great. These are small risks. You got to do it. Very important for science. But it's already a bit dangerous without introducing eccentric billionaires to the decision making. So here's the rule. Anyone who ever used the term disruptor unironically, you're banned from space travel. That's the yeah. rule. Yeah, yeah, fair. We we did miss out on that press conference, though, where they were like, okay, well, the good news is Big Bird wasn't on there. Wh why? <laughs> um, Because <laughs> he knew the ship was going to explode. <laughs> why didn't he say anything? He hates astronauts. Is this like that? <laughs> Is this like the whole Jewish people didn't go to the t Twin Towers on 9-11? Right, exactly. Nobody Jewish it. died on 9-11. Exactly. Yeah, Big Bird was in on the Challenger disaster. Ooh, and he's got a long <laughs> beak. He lives in New York. It's the Big Bird conspiracy. <laughs> he has an invisible friend with a hard to pronounce name. This all adds up. Eli, talk to your boys about that. Check <laughs> I would, out. I would talk to my birds about that. <laughs> <laughs> And finally tonight, in got a Bridgen to sell you news, Conservative <laughs> MP Andrew Bridgen has been suspended from his party this week after comparing the COVID-19 vaccine to the Holocaust. There it is. Oh, uh, is it because Americans ignored it till way too many people were dead? Oh, oh, uh, I like this game. Uh, Jewish lizard aliens did both to harvest oscillation magic and eat babies. 
Uh, g- great answers, great answers. But what Bridget went with in a now... I feel like I'm going to be really close. I'm it's not, pretty close. I feel like it's going to be close. <laughs> but what he actually went with in a tweet that he's since deleted, uh, he shared a link to a vaccine-related article from the far-right blog Zero Hedge and commented himself, he added the comment to it, as one consultant cardiologist said to me, this is the biggest crime against humanity since the Holocaust. And he means the vaccine there. Yikes. But, okay, that's terrifying. But I am honestly curious... What got replaced by the COVID vaccine on that ranking list that, they have <laughs> that was the worst since the Holocaust? I mean, unsurprisingly, this tweet caused an immediate backlash. People writing in all the newspapers, going crazy on Twitter, telling him this was a stupid thing to do. In fact, even Prime Minister Rishi Sunak denounced this message as, quote, utterly unacceptable. So, silver lining, congratulations, people. We finally found something this Tory party deems unacceptable. Yeah, the fascists hate it when you bring up the Holocaust. <laughs> yeah. Also, again, you got to check your British privilege, man. If this happens in the U.S., Rishi Sunak gives committee chairs to Bridgen and 19 other MPs who insist the Holocaust was a Ponzi scheme or something like that. That's fair. That is fair. Whereas what happened in the UK is he got suspended from the party here, which does mean that Bridgen will remain as MP for North West Leicestershire, but he's having to sit instead as an independent pending a formal investigation. So he's not a Tory. He's just an independent minister now. But it seems pretty clear what this investigation is going to find, especially given that he responded to the suspension by releasing a video stick where he doubles down on his claims about the alleged dangers of the COVID-19 vaccine and he decries the fact that the government wants to now give this vaccine to babies and children. Terrifying. Okay, investigation, day one. Listen to what that guy said about himself on purpose. Are we good? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We can close it all up and take an early lunch at that point because it's pretty clear. In this video, he he went on to highlight all the support that he's got after saying this from other completely incorrect people, including, quote, medical workers who are too intimidated to speak out. And, you know, you don't know them. They went to a different med school. (laughs) Thing is, he did, however, at least deny that his tweet was anti-Semitic because, as he explained, he asked an Israeli doctor that he knows what he thought about it, and that guy said it was fine. So, not anti-Semitic. And also, it wasn't anti-Semitic because he, because, quote, his message alluded to the Holocaust being the most heinous crime against humanity in living memory, unquote. And, you know, yes, right, you did do that, Andrew. But then you said that the vaccine against a deadly virus was samesies. And you you see how that's bad, right? Look, I said littering and killing Jews are both bad things to do. You guys are twisting my words (laughs) to eat lunch by myself. There has to be heinous littering. The words have to have meanings and fit stuff. Bridgen just clearly needs someone to install a whiteboard in his now independent office with a list of all of the things that are okay to compare to the Holocaust. And it can be a pretty fucking small whiteboard because that list is the actual Holocaust end of list. Okay, but what about Hup? Hup, no, you were done. You were done. (laughs) And this whole suspension, this comes after a busy few months for Bridgen. He spent all of December raising crazy anti-vaccine talking points in parliamentary debates and then tweeting a constant stream of conspiracy theory and misinformation since then. Oh, is he going to be a Hall of Assholes guy? Oh, he might well be. He might well be. If not him, then the people he's tweeting, there's, there's someone in there who's an absolute prime candidate that we may well get to. Excellent. But in all of this... I think there's another big silver lining, right? Because Bridgen's suspension means he's no longer an MP for the Tory party. Sunak had a majority of a certain size, and that's down by one now because he's lost one of his party. And back in November, Health Secretary, well, former Health Secretary Matt Hancock was also suspended for the party, this time because he went on a jungle-based reality TV show instead of doing his fucking job as an MP. So that's two down. You guys have such fun scandals. Ours are just right? like child rapists and... That's pretty much it. They're mostly child rapists. We've we've got those as well. We've just got much stronger (laughs) libel laws, so it's really hard to get those out. So I want to end with that silver lining here, right? Because I know that this show has got a lot of listeners in the UK, so this is a call to action. Because listeners, we need you to find your nearest middle-aged male Tory MP. It's easy. That's basically all of them. Um, And then (laughs) what we need you to do is we need to start radicalising them. Because if we put in enough collective effort, we can get them all to say or do something so insane they get kicked out of the party until we completely erode <laughs> Rishi Sunak's entire majority. It's a pretty good plan. Yeah, I reckon together we can red pill these fuckers right into a 2023 election. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Do you have a lot of Mikes and Michaels there? In, We've got in the, the we're waiting the wings. We can take over. Mikes of the UK rise up. <laughs> 
Never thought I'd see the day when Marsh was excited for another British election, but here we are, everybody. <laughs> here we are. Keep him coming till these fuckers are out. I could do one a day until we get rid of them. <laughs> oh, but Mike, 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 it's better than holding pattern. You guys could do stuff right away if you want to. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Michael Marshall. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all those new generous donors, you will be complimented next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Skating Atheist, Godawful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtual... <laughs> he is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with his permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Eli described it perfectly. He was like, you know when you have like a little too much bread and not enough to drink and mm. then it like sting hurts right at the top of like your, yeah. Yeah. Right, right below the esophagus and like feels like the middle of your chest is just- For yeah. five days straight. Ugh. Not stopping. Jesus. Did you eat a lot of bread by any chance? I must have, I must have like inserted an entire loaf into myself while I was asleep. <laughs> and it was just, oh, just the constituent working. ingredients and it, it baked into bread within you. And that's, that's why it true. was an inconvenient uh, I, location and shape. I always down a yeast packet before bed and I, I knew it was a bad idea. <laughs> All right. On the plus side, Marsh, pretty sweet gig when I die. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I've been looking for. Yeah, what what you don't know is I've, I've been subtly poisoning you from a distance. If you, if you ever get any un, unusual <laughs> packets of food through the mail. Yeah, you and me both, baby. <laughs> <laughs> My poison's called Oreos. <laughs> Literally not seen since the famous Winter of Disconsent in... No- Winter of Discontent in 1979. Which Winter is what- of Disconsent sounds way worse. <laughs> it does. It does. We, we, we dodged a bullet on that one. Boris Johnson's going to be in charge of the Winter of Discontent. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.